This video is brought to you by me. Check the Patreon link in the description below to see how you can support the channel directly for as low as $1 a month. Thanks for helping to keep the channel going. From the moment I finished Resident Evil 1's remake on the GameCube, I knew Resident Evil 2 wasn't going to be far behind. In fact, this video was supposed to be much earlier in the pipeline. I was house-sitting alone on a rainy night, ready to go when the sudden realization that I'd forgotten to pack a controller set in. I was so mad I didn't boot the game back up for six weeks. Eventually I came back to it, misdirected rage aside. My relationship with Resident Evil 2 is a bit odd. While Remake was the first game I completed as the Lord intended, I played Leon's campaign in Resident Evil 2 way back in high school on my PSP with unlimited ammo and a chain gun. Back then it was the only way I could ever see myself finishing that game, and after slaughtering everything in my path, I never bothered playing Claire's campaign. But even back then, the world of Raccoon City had me hooked. The atmosphere alone was enough to give me the chills. Even though I had only ever played the game once over the course of one night way back then, so much of the magic stood out to me. And now that I went back and played it again, I was shocked at how much I remembered just from that quick brush with it. The iconic opening where Leon must walk through the burning streets of the undead to seek shelter, the slow descent of the train and ensuing battle, the nightmare plant demons. When I was in high school and friends were talking about the series, I wanted to seem cool so I always said 2 was my favorite while conveniently omitting that it was the only one that let me cheese my way through to the finish. So playing RE2 from start to finish with Leon and Claire's campaign in full felt like reckoning with my own stupidity. Now when I say I love RE2, there's context attached to it, and I'm really excited to share with you why this game is spectacular even more than 20 years later. Let's get the obvious issues out of the way early. Coming from Remake, one of the best survival horror games of all time, realizing the GameCube version of Resident Evil 2 is little more than the Dreamcast port with slightly more control options is a bit disappointing. The graphics and voice acting are pretty dated, which in my opinion speaks less about RE2 and more shows how timeless Remake is. However, it does make the idea of a remaster in the vein of Resident Evil 1 a tad bittersweet, no matter how amazing the recent remake was. The graphics look understandably old, and the character models definitely jank around when asked to do complex movements in the cutscenes. At least it matches the script and subsequent voice acting. It's over. No. I have to find my brother. You're right. This is just the beginning. Outside of these small complaints about a game that looked fine when it came out, RE2 is fantastic. The situation in Raccoon City has gotten much worse since we left the Spencer Mansion. Since the Star's agents escaped near death in the first game, they've been demonized and dissolved. The Umbrella Corporation launched a smear campaign against the team, and with Raccoon City Police Department in their pockets, they managed to cover the T-Virus incident very easily. Raccoon City is a small town that owes much of its growth to Umbrella, so the townsfolk might be quick to forgive and ignore the pharmaceutical giant's mistakes and rather take the PR and spin they are fed and as a result, no one asked questions about the string of mistakes that led to the events of the first game. But the time for questions has long passed. Upon arriving in the city, Leon Kennedy, a rookie cop about to clock in for his first shift, and Claire Redfield, the college-age motorbike rider looking for her brother Chris, are immediately confronted with the zombie apocalypse that has descended on Raccoon. Talk about a case of the Mondays. Leon makes this game a little bit more political than it would be otherwise. If Resident Evil 1 was about a mega company playing God and experimenting on people for power gain and bioweapon crafting, Resident Evil 2 is about what the elite will do to stay unaccountable and how far they will go to cover up their mistakes. Leon is a newbie cop with the intentions to make a difference, and instead he walks into the belly of a corrupt police department that's sole purpose has evolved into being a puppet for Umbrella. Claire's story also kind of goes along with that idea because she is searching for her brother who has seemingly went off the grid. She can't get a call or message to him no matter how hard she tries, and after weeks of waiting, she goes to Raccoon to see for herself what the deal is. Chris, one of the protagonists from the first game, was exiled with the rest of his team of elite officers for doing their jobs. The stars literally died to get to the bottom of the Umbrella Conspiracy, and the only few members left were discredited and thrown away. 
In a lot of ways, Resident Evil 2 is about the shattering of innocence. Claire and Leon arrive in Raccoon City in the midst of what is essentially a localized version of the end of the world, and yet still the characters remain optimistic that everything will be fine. If Claire can just find her brother, everything will be okay. If Leon can just make it to the RPD headquarters, he can work with the other stand-up officers of the law to restore order. These characters are young and deliberately so. They act their age and still believe, even when presented with the information that everything is well beyond repair, that the light is still at the end of the tunnel. Only what they find is that they were never in a tunnel. They just walked into a one-way cave that ends abruptly, no end in sight. Side note, and this is an assumption based on how I read into Claire and Leon with no proof, I bet neither of them have worked a high school retail job, because by the time I was their age, I was nowhere near as optimistic as they are. For my playthrough, I chose to play as Leon because I wanted to see him at his roots. I loved Resident Evil 4 and wanted to see where he began as opposed to when he became a brooding, roundhouse-kicking agent from that game. And by the time it was over, I could absolutely see how he went from young policemen looking to save the day against all odds to diving out of second story windows. Now is a good time to mention that this is the wrong choice because according to a few different places on the internet, you're supposed to play as Claire first and Leon second, and it changes the story pretty drastically. Oops. Anyway, after splitting up, Leon and Claire set off on different paths to get into the police station, a place they both believe will be the safest place from the Scourge. Their naivety is on full display here. Upon arriving at the station after ducking the flaming undead walkers, Leon's biggest fear comes true. The RPD has fallen, and only stale, rotten air remains inside of the mansion-esque former art museum. Leon's focus shifts from saving his own skin to saving survivors while trying to dig into the truth about what happened in this otherwise sleepy town. After just finishing Remake, going into RE2 felt like a comfortable t-shirt, tank controls and all. I certainly missed the quick turn, but I learned to adjust. My mastery of clunky controls made me feel capable and ready to scoot around enemies, a skill that came in handy as many of the creatures you face are straight up bone chilling. I am not afraid of monsters, but liquors live in my head rent free. From the moment you turn the corner in the safe room and see that fucker crawl in front of the window, I knew I wasn't going to like what was coming next. From a bunch of shattered windows, in crawls this beast with razor sharp claws and a tongue that just won't quit. Lickers aren't the only horrifying creature you come across this time around either. Leon has run-ins with the G-Mutant multiple times, only the difference is he keeps mutating every time you see him, getting more and more powerful. I am also afraid of wasps, so this big-ass, moth-ass, wasp-ass demon made my stomach turn a little bit. Leon's arsenal of weapons made facing these demons a bit of a challenge as opposed to his counterpart. He begins with the Matilda, a small handgun that can be upgraded with a stock that enables the triple shot, a magnum reminiscent of Barry Burton's Silver Serpent but less cool looking, a single use Uzi, a shotgun, and a late game flamethrower. Through most of the game you're going to be stuck with the Matilda and the shotgun, and just because you're stuck in a police station doesn't mean you have piles of ammo at your disposal, and you might be wondering how that works, well instead of picking up a memo from an officer saying the ammo was running low as the zombies assaulted the station, the game justifies it by giving you a memo that Brian Irons, the police chief, has begun a full station sweep and relocation of ammo because of a pending terrorist threat. Because why would you want ammo when a terrorist is on the way? It's stupid, but for reasons we can circle back to, not as stupid as you think. But still stupid nonetheless. Leon and Claire converge in the star's office where we find out Chris has packed up and left, and the two agree to keep digging, Leon trying to bring down Umbrella with proof, and Claire so she can bring Chris home safely. Leon and Claire part ways again in order to gather evidence and cover new ground. Intermittently, Leon and Claire cross paths, but for the most part they're on their own until they meet their individual partners. Leon's partner throughout the story is Ada Wong, a spy looking for information on Umbrella while also disguising her motives under the ruse that she is looking for her boyfriend John and a journalist named Ben who could provide her with new info on him. Ada very clearly doesn't want a partner in the story, but Leon's naivety and drive to be the good guy makes it so he can't take a hint, no matter how obviously Ada tries to distance herself from him. After the duo finally finds Ben scared and locked in a cell he placed himself in to keep his head intact, he sends them into the sewers where they'll find the information they seek. Ada bolts and ditches Leon who follows as closely behind as he can. After finally catching up with Ada, he finds her in a standoff with Annette Birkin the wife of the scientist William Birkin, who is nowhere to be found. 
Annette tries to shoot Ada, but being the reasonable adult he is, Leon dives in front of her, taking the bullet himself. While Leon is unconscious, the player gets to control Ada as she pursues Annette deeper into the sewers. Ada controls very similarly to Leon as she is equipped with her own weapon. Earlier in the game, Ada is also used to help Leon get one of the station keys he wouldn't be able to get otherwise. After finally catching up to her, Ada confronts Annette and gets her to tell her about what's going on at the labs below. Umbrella learned about William's work on a new virus known as the G-Virus, and sends a team of agents in to kill him and take a sample of it. Instead of rolling over and dying, Will does the opposite, injecting himself with the virus and mutating into a monster. That mutant Leon keeps running across? That's William Birkin all along, ripping people in half and everything. As a result, Annette will do anything to protect William and his secret, even kill to do so. But before Annette has time to shoot Ada, Ada disarms her and sends her into the sewer water below. As Leon wakes up and gets bandaged by Ada, they set off deeper into the sewer system to find the G-Virus and Birkin. After hopping on a train platform that takes them to the Umbrella Labs, William shows himself once again, slicing through the train and injuring Ada. After a heated fight on the platform, William retreats and Leon carries Ada to safety in a safe room. Leon, alone again, sets off to explore the laboratory and faces the experiments inside, these mutated, mobile carnivorous plant monsters that spit venom. Time to put that flamethrower to good use, Kennedy. After restoring power to the lab and getting lucky from a falling pipe that saves him from certain death, Leon steals the vial of the G-Virus from Annette and sets off to find Ada and escape. And then, Ada turns on Leon, drawing a gun on him. After Leon refuses to give up the virus and makes her blink first, in one final breath, Annette shoots Ada from behind, sending her falling off the platform. In a fit of rage and despair, Leon throws the G-Virus into the abyss below, you know, like an idiot. He threw away the smoking gun that could have toppled Umbrella. As the lab's self-destruct countdown begins, it's time for one last showdown with Birkin in his most mutated form yet. Luckily, we've saved up enough ammo to kill this ass once and for all. With mere seconds to spare, Leon escapes the lab on the last train out of town with Claire and... Uh, who is this? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to the beginning. After escaping the fate of becoming the latest IHOP menu item, Claire takes a roundabout way to get into the police headquarters. Claire has a drastically different kind of weapon selection starting with a much bigger handgun. She eventually gets a crossbow which offsets Leon's shotgun, and a grenade launcher that shoots three kinds of ammo, regular grenades, incendiary grenades, and acid rounds. I found that this set of weapons made the game much easier as they were all very hard hitting, even the crossbow. It can shoot multiple rounds at a time. Claire's story is wildly different from Leon's and fills in a lot of the blanks from the first campaign. We see the reason there's a flaming helicopter on top of the station, for instance. We also get to see the first-hand truth behind some of the ammo shortage. After commandeering some C4 and a detonator, Claire blows up a hidden wall, revealing a pathway to Chief Iron's office slash that room that makes Ace Ventura scream in the sequel. Captain D-Bag, the department head for years, has been taking bribes from Umbrella in return for turning his head the other way regarding Umbrella's blunders, including the Spencer Mansion incident that led to stars being abandoned. At least in some roundabout way, this taxidermy enthusiast who's about to stuff the mayor's daughter loses everything in the outbreak, a result of his own hubris and ego. It's just a pity that the entire city literally had to die for him to get his comeuppets. In my experience, Claire's story was drastically superior, despite her being a more difficult character to play as with liquors everywhere. As much as I loved Ada playing Leon and Leon not being able to take a hint, I was way more interested in Claire's story and seeing the corruption unfold. After Claire meets Leon in the star's office, she stumbles upon a small girl named Sherry, Sherry Birkin, the daughter of the G-Virus's dad, William, and Annette. Claire sets her sights on trying to keep Sherry safe as she's stalked by the pale hulk in a trench coat dubbed Mr. X. X is a terrifying figure because he's seemingly indestructible and always seems to appear at the moment I'm taking a sip of something that is soon after spat all over the room as he Kool-Aid mans through a wall. This guy is dropped into the police station via helicopter to hunt Sherry because, as it turns out, her big gold necklace you can't possibly miss contains a sample of the G-Virus. Umbrella wants it back, and as Claire's M.O. is to protect Sherry, 
she crosses Mr. X more than a few times. After traveling through the mansion and reassembling the pieces of a puzzle in Iron's office, she is cornered by the Chief who has just gone full supervillain. Just before he pulls the trigger, Birkin reaches through the trapdoor in the floor and grabs him, slicing him clean in half. Now it's Claire's turn to face the G-Mutant himself. Luckily, after a few shots and dodging his lead pipe, he goes down easy, retreating into the depths below. Claire and Sherry make their way to the sewers too, just a few steps behind Leon and Ada. Before they can descend to the labs below, she has to retrieve the train where she faces Mr. X once again. Similarly to Leon, Birkin attacks the train on the way down, only this time the train locks itself into place. It unjams itself while Claire is in another part of the map, meaning Sherry and Claire are separated once again in this miserable lab. After eventually finding her way down into the lab, Annette corners her too, and is only distracted by security footage of Mr. X cornering Sherry. Claire dashes to save her, and just in the nick of time, Sherry throws Claire her pendant, allowing Sherry to make a quick escape. Tricking Mr. X into playing fetch with the pendant, she dodges a punch from the beast which sends the lab into the self-destruct sequence. Claire chucks the pendant into a molten pit below, and X chases it into the lava. But this bastard won't die! He crawls out of the fire, ready to face Claire one last time when she isn't expecting it. With Sherry on the train, Claire has to restore power to the tracks, and doing so distracts her long enough for Mr. X to make his move. After a heated back and forth battle where very little damage seems to be done to the hulking beast, a mysterious shadow that definitely isn't Ada tosses Claire a rocket launcher, very reminiscent of the first game. One shot is all it takes, and Mr. X is toast. Claire jumps on the train the moment Leon makes his final appearance, and they escape on the train together. Roll credits. Just kidding. The train has a self-destruct sequence too, and it detects a potential viral outbreak on board. Birkin didn't die during Leon's final battle after all, and appears on the train as a big rotten scoop of my high school cafeteria's Tuesday surprise. In the true final showdown, Sherry stops the train while Claire holds Birkin off. Leon escapes through a hatch in the bottom of the train, and the three escape as the train explodes. The game ends with Claire vowing to find her brother, and Leon swears to bring down Umbrella, which would have been a lot easier if he didn't throw the virus into the void. Resident Evil 2 was a non-stop thrill ride from start to finish. It was an absolute blast, likely due to how the puzzles changed drastically between campaigns. And as I mentioned earlier, they change again if you play Claire A and Leon B. There is so much to love about this game, I can see why it's some people's favorite. Well, younger me, I finally finished RE2 in its intended way. Are you happy now? I am. Crushing the first two Resident Evils was something you never thought you'd be able to accomplish, and look at you now. Unemployed and telling people you play video games for a living. The human spirit is truly resilient. This game was a wholly wonderful experience, and even though I played through both campaigns within two days, I still want to go back and play the campaigns in opposite order to see how the story was truly meant to be experienced, or at least retconned into being the correct timeline. As much as I loved the Resident Evil 2 remake, I wish there would have been a remaster of this game the way it was when Remake of 1 came out, and after searching I realized a similar remake was planned, but was scrapped so development wouldn't delay Resident Evil 4. And we all know how that turned out. While we may never get that kind of remake, the game that we are left with is truly something special, a great follow-up to an already great game. It retains a lot of the tension and soul that was so good about Resident Evil 1, and it's a more than worthy successor to one of the best games I have ever played. Thank you so much for watching my video, I really appreciate it. If you like the video, please consider leaving a like on it. What is your favorite Resident Evil? Let me know in the comments down below. Lastly, if you don't want to miss another one of my videos, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications. If you want to support the channel directly, you can go to my Patreon link below and check it out. I want to take a moment to mention my higher tier patrons, Andrew Lang, Andrew Elmore, and 8-Bit Jesus. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.